Okay, everybody, let's get started. Uh, we're a little bit late already. Um, this is Jean-Philippe Gervais, who has been working on the um, retrospective for Ed Bryant's um, uh, career since before he passed away. And he <laughs> exactly. will have some good, wonderful information for us today, I'm pretty sure. All right. Okay. Go for it. Um, uh all right, hi everybody. So, um, so I'm not sure if everybody here already knows. Did you believe, uh, Stays, that everybody here knows already about the project, or should I give I, a little I, background I information? I believe that everybody here yes. uh, is aware of the is aware of the project. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, yes, indeed, this has been a very uh, multi-year uh, project since a number of years before Ed passed away. But we we are. Uh, we are nearing the finish line. So we've had, along the way, we've had a publisher pass away. We have had uh, various health issues, serious health issues for a lot of the people involved in the project. Um, then in 2017, um, uh, Ed's uh, himself uh, passing away. And um, so it's been quite a lengthy project um, with all sorts of ups and downs along the way. But as I wrote to Stays back in uh, August, and I believe I wrote to him, actually on Ed's birthday, that uh, the manuscript ha has been completed. It's in the hands of the publisher, George Vanderberg, with whom I'm working um, here in Canada. And right now we're simply at the stage where we're finalizing the kind of the, you know, the, the layout, the layout, book design and all that um, to make sure that uh, uh, everything fits. Because what we're doing right now is we're doing two print volumes as well as a kind of a digital volume. And it's not going to be an ebook. It's going to be like, um, uh, it's going to be in the form of PDF files formatted exactly as a book. So it's not going to be uh, in the format of an, of an ebook for which you need an, an ebook reader, right? It's just going to be in the form as if a book had been scanned, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to be the third digital volume. Now, in all of those three titles, we're going to have the entirety of Ed's fiction. And that's why the project has taken so long, because we're talking uh, many thousands of pages of, uh, of fiction. Um, and so the two books, the two books right now, the first one is entitled On the Roads to Cinnabar and essentially um, gathers together most of Ed's science fiction um, and it's 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 mainly the first part of his career, although it has a number of pieces that he wrote later on. Whereas the second title is going to be Flirting with Death, which has mostly um, uh, stories that he wrote like after the mid 1980s when he started writing kind of dark fantasy and horror fiction. Um, all of the all of the artwork, as as I wrote to to Stace when I when I gave him the update to last August, all of the artwork is done. Um, that's ever, now then the artwork the artwork consists of both original art as well as uh, photographs uh, for which and for, for all of that we, we've gotten uh, very graciously um, the uh, authorization of everybody involved to uh, to use their uh, their uh, artwork photographs in the project. Um, I even for example managed to track down some of the artists who did. Um, the artwork for some of Ed's stories that appeared in, in magazines like Asimov's Science Fiction. They granted us the permission to use their art that appeared like almost 40 years ago. For those, well, I mean, I'm assuming all of those in the room are from Denver. So um, around the year 2000, there was a big uh, article about Ed in, um, oh, I'm having a blank right now, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, free weekly that's that was distributed in uh, in Denver was it Mile High, Westward, well, uh, Westward, Westward. That was it. Okay, so there was a big there was a big piece about Ed when he organized the uh, World Horror uh, Convention in two thousand in uh, Denver, and for that um, for that article uh, there was a photo shoot done by a photograph named Anthony Camera, and I managed to track him down as well. And so he gave me the permission to use the photographs that he had done for that shoot. Same thing, the article that was that was done uh, for that piece will also be used in the in in volume two of the retrospective. Um, there are a number of photographs that come from uh, friends of Ed. Uh, most of those photographs, um, I, I I decided to choose them after seeing them on the friends of Ed page on Facebook. 
And I, then I got in touch with the individuals concerned. And as I say, everybody has been absolutely wonderful um, to allow us to, to, to use uh, their photographs. And as I say, we also have most of the stories have new original black and white art to accompany them. Um, in addition, um, Ed wrote a few stories, not many, but a few stories in collaboration, one with Dan Simmons, um, one which was kind of a round rob, uh, two which were round robin stories, one with uh, Connie Willis, Steve Tem, and Dan Simmons, and the other one with Kathy Koja, um, uh, Graham Swift, and Kelly Eskridge. And uh, for both, in both instances, they gave us the the uh, the rights to to republish those round robin stories. So that's a lot of fun. And there was also one very humorous short story of Ed's called "The Man of the Future," which was published in a little. Uh, pamphlet by Roadkill Press back in the, I would say, I think it was about the mid 80s. And what was fun about that pamphlet was that it was actually illustrated by Dan Simmons, who's actually a very good artist. And so Dan gave us the authorization to use his illustrations from that pamphlet to, to accompany the story again in uh, volume two of the, of the retrospective. Now, in terms of, now, both books are gonna be in hardcover. To give you an idea, in terms of size, it's going to be, and and that's actually one of the, one of the last logistical issues that we have to uh, <laughs> resolve the publisher and I because we've been in contact with the printer that the publisher uses, and we would have two options, which are not very different in terms of sizes, but one would be the size of like a typical um, Arkham House book for those of you who know Arkham House. So it's kind of the regular general size of a hardcover, whereas the other one would be slightly bigger, which is the size that, you, that uh, for example, Subterraneous Pre Subterranean Press uses in its uh, current publishing. So, so one would be just slightly bigger, the other one is slightly smaller. Um, very often, it's not so much an issue of, of, of the text that you can fit into a page, because we're not going to, you know, we're, we're using... Uh, uh, normal print size. This is not going to be like microscopic print size. We're using normal print size. Um, so it's just a question of, as both books are going to be about uh, six to 700 pages long, more or less. So in terms of what what is what is, uh, uh, what is more comfortable, I guess, to you to hold as a reader, is it better if it's slightly bigger the size, perhaps, if the book is thicker, perhaps it's easier than if the book is a little bit smaller. So that's that's actually, as I say, one of the few uh, logistical issues that we just need to, to decide upon, which we're going to do shortly. Um, otherwise, in terms of the artwork, uh, those of you who saw um, uh, stays, po stays posted on the Friends of Ed page, the, the little uh, brochure that I had printed up uh, a few about three years ago, um, kind of uh, uh, promoting the project. And the the artwork which was which which ran across both um, both uh, outside pages of the brochure is a, is a spread done by uh, Phil Norman. Some of you might know Phil; he's from Denver, and it was for a publication in a in a local uh, comics magazine back in about 1982 when Phil started to illustrate uh, the Road to Cinnabar, one of Ed's sto uh, stories. Now, Phil never did complete the entirety of the project. However, what he did is going to be used, uh, that's gonna appear on the digital um, uh, volume, along with a few other um, uh, comics adaptations of Ed's stories. But for the dust jacket of volume one, it is that same uh, big uh, uh, artwork that, as I say, if you go on the Friends of Edge page and you look at the post that uh, stays, uh, Posted on there, like in late August around Ed's birthday, uh, when I when I had written to him, then uh, you can see. So that's going to be the artwork for the dust jacket, and then Phil is going to do the the titling of the uh, because uh, I've been in touch with him again recently, and he expressed that uh, he would like to do himself kind of the titling. Uh, so basically, you know, the, kind of doing the artwork for the title uh, that would appear that would be on volume one of the um, of the retrospective. So uh, now volume two, what's fun for volume two is that it's um, uh, both for the dust jacket and for, for a few illustrations inside, it's going to be uh, artwork from an, a pretty well-known artist named Alan M. Clark. And this was artwork that uh, Clark had done for a project of Ed's short stories in the mid to late 90s 
that was supposed to be published and it bounced around from one small press to another until it just was dropped. And it was supposed to be called the same title we're going to use now, Flirting with Death. And um, before I'd passed away, he and I had spoken at length. And, and at, the, at that time, there was still the issue of, are we doing multi-volumes? Are we just doing one huge volume? Um, but he had expressed uh, you know, some regret that uh, this volume of his darker fiction from the late 90s had never actually materialized. And he had told me that uh, how much he had loved the artwork, but he didn't remember who the artist was. And he in particular um, appreciated the one piece which illustrated his short story, Flirting with Death, where you could see kind of a woman curled up alongside the Grim Reaper. And it's uh, a few years after he passed away, really just through the magic of the internet, I managed to track down and to identify uh, this artwork, got in touch with Alan and Clark. And again, you know, through discussions, um, we, we came to an agreement uh, whereby we could use his artwork for uh, for this particular project. So basically, I mean, last year at this time, I told everybody that uh, the book would be in hand by the, to the next Mile High Con. Well, of course, as has been uh, too often the case in, in this particular project, uh, you know, real life constraints happened along the way. But nonetheless, um, this year, as I said previously, the manuscript is fully complete. It's in the hands of the publisher. We're working on the layout right now. Um, we're, we're in talks with the printer. Uh, we're going to finish the, the titling with um, with uh, Phil Norman for, for his the dust jacket featuring his artwork. And we've also got another graphic designer helping us out uh, who specialized in book design. Uh, in order to to wrap things up, uh, you know, as, as quickly as possible, basically, uh, keeping in mind that this is all obviously this is all something that we're doing in our in our spare time. So, <laughs> so uh, um, now beyond that, and and Stace, if 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 yourself or anybody along the way, you know, has any has any questions, please be feel free. But otherwise, I'm just kind of going by myself and just uh, <laughs> throwing out the information. But if anybody no along the way, okay. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, let me think, because I'm, I don't want to repeat myself too much from last year. But uh, on the other hand, I, I'm not sure if everybody who's there tonight was there last year. So let me think right now. One section, which is certainly interesting. And um, before I we, uh, we actually started this panel, I was hearing one person in the room speaking with Stace about uh, Harlan Ellison. And in the first volume, we have one section called the uh, Dangerous Visionaries, which is all about Ed's uh, relationship, friendship, uh, mentorship with uh, Harlan Ellison from the late 60s, basically all the way to, to both of their, of their passings. Um, and that's really a fun little section. Um, it has two pieces of fiction in there that are Harlan related. One is called Kicks Are For Kids, which is a very kind of very sweet and humorous little little piece from the early 70s from Ed. Um, and the second one is called The Lie That Lights. And that was published as an afterword to the hardcover uh, edition of uh, Harlan Ellison's novella, All the Lies That Are My Life, which is actually an absolutely excellent uh, novella by Ellison. And, and it, if, if some of you have not read this, you should read it because Ed is actually featured under a, a fake name in that uh in that novella and um now I, I i'm trying to think of the of the name he's under in the book i think it's bram something but if any of you read the novella and can't figure it out just please put a post on the friends of edge of the friends of ed page and i will make sure and identify to you who uh who is ed but anyway the reason why i'm mentioning this is that when is when the novella was published in a hardcover format by underwood miller in the very early 80s Harlan asked a bunch of his friends to contribute afterwards. So people like Ursula Le Guin, Norman Spinrad, uh, Philip Jose Farmer, uh, Robert Silverberg, as well as Ed Bryant. And what Ed did was he didn't contribute kind of the regular type, you know, nonfiction afterward discussing Harlan, his work, and or, uh, you know, the friendship. What he did was he did kind of a, a little semi-fictional story of a few pages long um and um in 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 some commentary about that story that ed uh, published in another in another uh, fanzine a few years later he said that it was kind of in the vein of truman capote's uh, in true blood you know so in the sense of using real events but just kind of uh 
taking flight from those to make them uh, fictional in nature. So anyway, it's an absolutely uh, beautiful little story. It's very, very, very well done and touching, which I, I think very few people know about. That's going to be the last story in volume one. And um, so for anybody who's in, and, and in that section as well, there are a bunch of nonfiction pieces by Ed about Harlan and especially about their years together in Los Angeles in the early 1970s, which are really a lot of fun to read. When and he then was there are Ed's few... cabana boy. I'm sorry? When he was Ed's cabana boy. <laughs> that's that's the way Ed put it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that's quite the way Harlan would have put it, would have described so... it, but yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so that that's that's a really fun little uh, little section of the book uh, that was very, very enjoyable to put together. Um, oh, and in, the, and in that light, um, those of you who don't know about this, um, the, the famous white whale of science fiction, which is the anthology The Last Dangerous Visions, is going to be published next year in 2024 um, by a publisher. Um, it does not contain all of the original stories bought, bought by Arlen and Harlan in the, in the 70s uh, because he just bought too many, which was, I think, the main reason why the project was never completed of his, during his lifetime. Um, his, the executor of Harlan's estate is J. Michael Straczynski, the, the, the guy who uh, created Babylon 5. And he negotiated with a publisher to publish a pared down um, edition of The Last Dangerous Visions, which are going to have a selection of stories bought, purchased by Harlan in the 70s as well as a few uh, newer stories from some of Harlan's friends and or writers that, that he appreciated. Now, the reason I'm why I'm mentioning this right now is that one of the few uh, good, I think, one of the few good things about the project having dragged on so long is that we had anticipated including Ed's contribution to The Last Dangerous Visions in our project. But when we got word back in, I think it's already two years ago, that the last dangerous visions was uh, was announced, and um, after I and when I realized that Ed's contribution war stories uh, was uh, it was complicated contemplated to use it in there, so immediately we pulled it out from the retrospective so that it could be used in there, and so that's going to be really wonderful that uh, Ed's uh, store contribution to Harlan's anthology from like what almost maybe not fifty years ago, but at the very oh almost 50 years ago. So Ed's, Ed's story that's going to appear in The Last Dangerous Visions is from at most the mid-70s, but it's about 1973, more or less. And that story, uh, for those of you that, that are interested, now I'm assuming probably most of you either have read or know about one of Ed's better known stories from the early 70s called Shark. And what I, I think pretty much no one knows about it, was that Shark was that Ed after he published that story Shark he intended to actually write a complete novel about the characters featured in that short story Shark now Shark was supposed to be the last chapter of that novel and the novel was supposed to be entitled Legends of the Great War and Ed wrote a number of separate chapters but it was it was very much the age of a uh, new age uh, new age science fiction so it was it was very very um, kind of an impressionistic style of writing, and the stories did not necessarily the chapters did not necessarily fit in together all that well, but did feature kind of the same background and and some of the same characters. So um, what Ed did is he he got together most almost all of the chapters that he had written, put them in an order, and then just entitled that War Stories, and that was his contribution. To the last dangerous vision so that story wh whenever you read it uh, about a year or so from now uh, you can uh, you, you'll be able to spot that it i will try and speak a bit louder so for people listening on video it'll be a bit uh a bit a bit, a bit loud but anyway um, all right. So what? So basically, I was just finishing up uh, chatting about the the, uh, the the story, Ed's story, war stories appearing in the Last Dangerous Vision, and that's certainly something um, quite uh, quite fun. And I'm really happy that uh, posthumously this this is something that could happen, kind of tie in together Ed and Harlan, even in a posthumous fashion. So that's quite wonderful, actually. Um, 
beyond that, um, basically, it's been just a question of finishing finishing the project right now, um, and putting together uh, the the last uh, the last pieces. So, I mean, I can't I can't give you a specific date right now, but I mean, we're we're really at the finish line, so it's only a matter of I would guess uh, just a, a few months basically to finish the work on this, um, and then it'll finally be um available um so i'm trying to think of um other uh, interesting uh little nuggets of information i could uh, i could provide you that that i haven't uh, that i haven't discussed already in, in previous years well um there there are some some there, i mean some of the uh some of the choices that i've made for example in terms of uh, i was discussing artwork and photographs uh before um some of the the interesting decisions that we made in terms of artwork is for example to accompany Ed's the last uh, last story that he wrote which is called Marginal Hands and which is kind of a almost kind of a an homage to to himself and his house uh, which he loved so much and um in which the character has a more a more grislier ending but uh, suffers the same fate as Ed which is to slide down a flight of stairs on his back, which uh, I think all of you know that happened to Ed back in 2014, I believe. Um, so to accompany that particular story then, um, before, uh, after Ed's house was emptied, but before it was all uh, remodeled inside, I took some pictures of the interior of the house and so, and as well as the exterior. And so those pictures accompany that particular story, which is the very last story in volume two, in the volume two, Flirting with Death. And so that's, again, the, the, the whole idea of the project here is to both present Ed's stories to, to readers and to preserve them uh, for the future. But all, it was also to give kind of, a, you know, as much kind of biographical information uh about ed as possible and also to gather together as much information about ed so you know that's why i was talking previously of uh collaborative works um our articles about him pho uh, photographs taken of him for other for for you know newspaper articles or things like that um and so i think i think once once everything is is put together it, hopefully it's going to give a pretty good overview, not only of his career, which we could have done just by having one story after another, but also of the individual um, through uh, through the contributions of both himself and other people. So hopefully that we will have attained that goal uh, uh, once you hold uh, the books in your hand. And um, in terms of introductions and forwards, those come from many of his friends, and all of those uh, were were written uh, following his passing. A few were written before, while he was still alive and the project had been started. But some of these contributions were, were written after Ed passed away, and Ed himself contributed uh, substantial uh, introductions and story notes to all of the of the thematic uh, sections in both volumes. So that. I think that contributes a lot to the value um, of the project. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, I approach this, I think, with the same uh, the same view as I think some of the early uh, small presses uh, approached projects, like, for example, the, the, the Arkham House people like August Derleth and all that. They basically um, approached the, the short story collections as being to preserve the stories of writers that that he admired that had been published in the pulp magazines in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and whose works would otherwise have just uh, vanished because at the time, nobody really was collecting pulp magazines too much. And so that's why names that are now household names like uh, H.P. Lovecraft or Clark Ashton Smith or Robert E. Howard all started with short story collections public published by Arkham House, which put together and preserved stories that otherwise could have simply been forgotten. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that since Ed's um, career is essentially built around the short story, while his stories are 
you know, really spread out all over the place. And, you know, there are a few collections of his that exist, but they really gathered just only a slight fraction of, of, of the work that he's published. So really the whole, the whole uh, mindset behind this work has been to pub to, to gather together in one place um, all of his work so that both for current fans, future fans, but also for um, anybody who would be interested, for example, by reading this more extensive collection um, to, you know, to propose to a more commercial publisher, kind of a, you know, a best of it, Brian, of maybe just, a, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 stories, something like that, as opposed to these big, huge volumes. And so that that's really the whole mindset behind it, which is to, to protect, uh, not so much protect, but preserve and gather together all these stories, which are otherwise uh, very, very difficult to track down. Now, I was, you know, Ed had manuscripts for most of his own stories, although some of them were missing. And so ultimately, we had, you know, I had to track down um, a lot of these stories, just tracking down very, very kind of obscure magazines sometimes or very obscure uh, anthologies from the late, from the early uh, 70s or late 60s. And so the, the the whole idea is now that all of these stories will be gathered together, organized and presented in 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 a in a, in an interesting fashion or an attractive fashion, then perhaps it's going to draw more attention to the to the individual stories, but also to the more global work of Ed uh, that he's completed uh, throughout his career. So that that's the whole uh, outlook for the project. Thank you very much, Stace. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.